Hello and welcome to this first of the High Rise Firefighting uh, webinar videos. Uh, my name is Russ Timpson and I am the organiser of the Tall Building Fire Safety Network. Uh, and it's great to have you with us here today. We've got a great programme today. Um, and to start with, in a moment, we're going to be hearing from Adam Course, who's going to be doing a feature called Looking Back to Look Forward, uh, with some really interesting issues to do with pump pressures and, um, and flow rates for high-rise firefighting. Uh, in, if you don't know, the, the T70 initiative that we've launched is an, is an attempt to try and connect firefighters from uh, 70 cities around the world to have an open discussion about high-rise firefighting and all the problems and challenges that go with it. So we're going to be going over to Adam in a moment to, uh, to watch that particular presentation. And then we've got a great international panel lined up of experts, high-rise firefighting experts. Um, and we've got uh, Brent Brooks who will be joining us from Toronto in Canada. Uh, Curtis Massey, a recognised expert over in the US. Uh, Michael Reek from Germany, um, who's been one of the pioneers of smoke control for firefighting in tall building firefighters. Um, Sergio Selman from Chile will share experience from a major incident that they had to deal with down in, uh, down in Chile. Uh, John Roberts from the UK, who's the chair of the National Fire Chief Council for high rise firefighting issues. Uh, John Esposito from the Fire Department of New York, uh, will also be with us and sharing some of his tips and experience. And uh, finally, but not least, Mark Riley from Australia. So you can see there, we've got a great panel for you today. And I've asked them to give us their topical high-rise firefighting tips and then go on to uh, just explain some of their, their approaches to some of the challenges we face uh, as high-rise firefighters around the world. So uh, lots to learn, hopefully lots of discussions to be formed and uh, I'll be back at the end of the program with some news updates uh, for you. Hello, Russ, and uh, hello to everyone involved in the High Rise uh, Firefighting Roundtable. Russ, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, really appreciated it. You gave me a subject looking back uh, to look forward, and you gave me a brief of providing a, a 10 minute or so video. I've chosen a subject that transcends all firefighting scenarios but is, I believe, too commonly associated with high-rise firefighting alone. Uh, I'm going to overview a problem uh, apparent from many UK fire-related firefighter fatality, serious accident and near-miss related fire incidents, and that is inadequate flow rates. And there are multiple reasons for that, and I'm just going to discuss uh, one of those reasons. Um, I'm going to discuss a solution to one part of the inadequate flow rate problem, how it's found from a service perspective, an Avon Fire Rescue Service perspective, and that is the Delta Break Apart branch. I'm going to give an overview of the problem or a problem caused by the solution, jet reaction. Uh, I'm going to discuss a solution to the jet reaction problem, which is basically firefighters understanding firefighting, um, practicing with equipment and using uh, using their equipment to its full capability. Uh, in terms of a disclaimer, 10 minutes is not going to cover all of the issues mentioned to or inferred to here. Firefighting in all of its forms, training, research, learning, sharing, operations, equipment, tactics, command, guidance, funding, should all be considered, I believe, holistically. Solving one issue in isolation of others can cause additional problems elsewhere. This is a snapshot of the viewpoint of the presenter, myself at the time of um, the presentation. Uh, and is subject to change where new and additional knowledge comes to understanding. I believe there is a, an apparent lack of understanding of fire science underpinning fire engineering principles, principles of fire behaviour, fire dynamics and hydraulics, especially related to the fire ground. If we provide firefighters with a toolbox that only has one or two tools in it, and I'm talking about cognitive or uh, practical tools, uh, if we only provide a half empty or an empty toolbox, then is it any wonder we're going to uh, identify issues? Should we provide a suite of tools, cognitive and practical tools, um, and appropriately, appropriate skills um, and provide firefighters uh, those tools when we ask them to deal with uh, varied incidents in the built environment and the natural environment for that matter? Uh, one aspect, inadequate flow rates has been identified or inferred to uh, most fire-related UK firefighter fatality serious accident incidents for one reason or another. 
specifically today you're going to look at blocked firefighting branches for this short presentation uh, branches blocked with what um, which branches baffled branches or smoothbore branches baffled branches uh, can block and there are times when they cannot be unblocked uh, easily at all without losing water turning off the water supply or you've completely lost the water supply uh, in the first place they can get blocked with riser debris pressure fed fire main debris open water source debris appliance tank debris which normally comes from either open water or pressure fed um, supplies uh, the pictures there show some uh, examples of uh, riser, uh, debris that's been found in branches and in particular the ones across the top there and the one down the side uh, shows riser debris that came from a situation where multiple wet risers in the Bristol area had been converted to dry risers, uh, had corroded, uh, they were quite old risers, and crews only realised this on several occasions when they had gone to uh, properties, high rise properties, uh, dwellings, and uh, charged the risers, got, tried to get a jet to work and then very quickly realised that the branches uh, became blocked and there was a complete loss of firefighting water. I organised a high-rise drill, uh, completely independent of uh, this. Um, two branches uh, got to work on the eighth floor of a high-rise uh, building that enabled us to do that with a, with, you know, with a, with a, with a balcony that we could use. Uh, the uh, scope there was to test flow meters to highlight the advantages of them in relation to head loss, frictional losses, and just understanding flows. The jet on the left, 450 litres per minute. The jet on the right, uh, if you can call it that, 40 to 70 litres per minute. What we later found out uh, was that the uh, branch, the baffled branch, had become blocked with a coupling washer. It wasn't one of ours. We had every coupling washer on all of the four appliances that were in attendance. We, so we just it wasn't ours, uh, so it could only have been in the riser. Uh, we assume from uh, maintenance tests or testing, uh, but clearly the consequences uh, uh, were clear. Uh, we've seen other uh, incidents or other uh, scenarios where. Uh, we've seen uh, debris from tanks uh, block high pressure hose reels. This one here particularly. Based on the pressures that the um, pump was set at, this should have been flowing at about 100 to 110 litres per minute. It was flowing about 40 litres per minute, which is roughly a 60% reduction in expected flow. Carried out some research into several firefighter fatality incidents, including Harrow Court. Uh, I went to Kent to meet Paul Grimwood to understand some flow rate issues. Uh, I then went up to Hertfordshire to look at flow meters in use and to look at the Delta break apart branch that Hertfordshire at the time had uh, developed with Delta fire and looked at some of the advantages and there had been some issues with uh, block branches at Harrow Court as an example. Uh, I also met a firefighter Martin Arrowsmith um, and gained a terrific insight into pump operation and the number of flow rates as well and what that guy doesn't know about pump operation and flow meters is worth knowing. Uh, this is the branch. Uh, it's the Delta Break Apart branch. It has a uh, baffled uh, uh, head that can, un that can uncouple, you can unscrew it, and it also has some smoothbore modules 24, 19, and uh, 15 millimeter. Crew manager Alexi Aragon and Red Watch down at Temple uh, carried out some additional proofing research and produced a paper on the capabilities of the branch for use as an external covering jet and external fire attack. And this was related to the Grenfell Tower incident. Their aim was to move the branch uh, from trials at six stations to being used uh, on all Avon appliances at every station. The headlines from their research, multiple combinations of branches, hose and pressures was tested. The maximum effective jet um, height was 32 meters or the 12th floor from the ground level and this is using the delta branch 10 bar 70 mil hose and the 24 mil nozzle significant spray was produced and that did affect branch operator visibility uh, but importantly very high jet reactions uh, are potentially produced or are produced when you're when you're flowing uh, that much water uh, the picture on the left was a building that the jet simply uh, went over the top 
so they needed to find another taller building and the picture on the right uh, was found and you can see that the jet there is getting to the 12th floor so interesting and, and the other branches won't get into anything like that high the baffled branches uh, the problem however is jet reaction smoothbore nozzles can produce very significant jet reaction this of course depends on flow which depends on pump pressure, nozzle diameter, the availability of water in the first instance. If you haven't got the water, you're not going to be able to pump it. You've got 300 litres, you're not going to get terrible jet reaction off of a, off a lay flat hose uh, in this case, uh, compared to some of the, the, the bigger flows. It also depends on frictional losses, head loss uh, or potential gain, uh, which depend on, for example, the hose lengths, the diameters in use and the height of the branch above the pump or potentially below it. Every time a branch is used on any given floor, there will be differences and variations. Uh, sometimes this is significant. It can also depend on hose management, for example, kinks, fire ground configuration, pump operation. Uh, at least one UK firefighter uh, fatality incident has involved jet reaction, a firefighter being struck by an out of control branch. How many other injuries uh, have happened? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we need to understand this as a risk. We need to balance the risk and then manage it with, for example, training uh, and understanding uh, of the issue. Um, the solution to jet reaction, I think effective and adequate understanding of underpinning principles of hydraulics, fire science, fire engineering uh, with regards to firefighting or help. Uh, familiarity with branch handling techniques and using 45, 51, 52 mil hose if relevant and of course 70 mil hose management, practicing with jets. Familiarity and experience in dealing with a branch out of control. Uh, should we be doing that more, uh, more often? Yeah, there's a risk with doing that drill, but the benefits, I believe, of using smooth bore nozzles in certain circumstances outweigh the risks of effective training with um, certain techniques. We need to learn from past incidents. Um, look, I didn't have much time to talk about smoothboard jet and baffled branch tactical advantages in high rise, low rise, and potentially all firefighting scenarios. I didn't have time to talk about the ex advantages of external fire attack. I didn't have time to talk about the reasons for inadequate flow rates at incidents. I didn't have time to talk about how I would hope at some stage flow meters are used on all appliances across the country. Uh, and that becomes as commonplace as thermal imaging cameras are at the moment on all appliances. I didn't have uh, time to discuss the importance of a future UK FRS, whole UK FRS paradigm shift to working in flow and pressure rather than pressure in isolation. Some services do this, some don't. I uh, didn't have time to talk about the variety of fire phenomena and fire behaviour encountered in the built environment. Didn't have time to talk about the degra degradation, de-skilling in relation to pump basic pump operator skills across UK FRS. Didn't have time to talk about air entrainment into the pump. Didn't have time to talk about the importance of learning from past firefighter fatality, near miss, the serious uh, accidents on a global scale. And I didn't have time to talk about the IFE firefighter safety database where there are a number of incidents available for helping people learn and understand about incidents that have gone wrong. Right, thank you very much for your uh, invitation to speak and I hope you have a good uh, roundtable discussion uh, and get lots of uh, points raised. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Fantastic. So it's question time everybody um, and I think what I'd like to start with first uh, Brent uh, with yourself. You heard earlier on that we're having a bit of a debate here in, um, in the UK about what happens when we change fire strategies, evacuation strategies in the midst of a fire? So if we have a building which is predicated on a uh, remain in place, stay put, um, and because it's a cladding fire and that now becomes not viable, uh, and we have to now start thinking about getting people out of the building, how do you cope with that? Is that something that you recognize? And what are the, what are the, what are the ways that you go around tackling it? So, so with us here in Canada, it's it's really been a timing thing. So we've decided to time every single thing that we do. Um, we hit buttons in our truck that tells us, you know, how long it takes to get our bunker gear on, how long does it take us to um, to get to the building address. And our new time, we're calling it our second arrival time for high rise buildings, and that's how long it takes to get from the parking brake on up to the actual fire location. 
So in our city, it's an average of six minutes and 24 seconds. So what's going to happen in that six minutes and 24 seconds? Prior to our arrival and when the building um, uh, alarm system going off, that is the uh, best time for people to uh, exit the building. Once the fire department gets there, we need to get firefighters up and actually have a look and, and, and see what's happening. So our strategy can change from shelter in place to um, a three floor evacuation or a entire building evacuation. So this, the circumstances change depending on what we're doing. But we found by timing um, our, our tasks will help us in determining uh, in, in, in that decision making, are, are we gonna shelter in place or are we gonna do a full evacuation? And just, uh, this is, as I say, a particular interest at the moment. Um, when you have complicating factors, I mean, it's never straightforward, is it, our job? Uh, when you have complicating factors like, you know, smoke locked, smoke logged corridors in, in which you're gonna then ask, or hopefully you're gonna direct people to evacuate along. Um, have you, do you use smoke hoods or what, what kind of arrangements have you got for protecting people when they're, when they're confronted with that issue of moving potentially in smoke? We're not going to go um, protection hoods at the moment. Um, what we are doing is we do have areas of refuge. Uh, we're trying spiral ducting. I, know, I don't think any other department in the world is doing this right now, but uh, we're pretty much locking down the fire floor the smoke to the fire floor and venting out the fire fire apartment uh, almost every single time it's just simply by using uh, spiral ducting so we want to limit the amount of smoke that goes to the stairwell it 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 has been successful uh, what we also uh, are trying on when we look at area refuge we don't necessarily have to uh, evacuate people to uh, certain floors and that's our and that's a standard way of um, area refuge but we can actually move people to one side of the building um, that has the most uh, uh, wind pressure. So it's simply cross the hall and you're in an area refuge versus coming down uh, several stories to an area refuge. So the building's gonna dictate what we're gonna do and the conditions are gonna di dictate what we do, but uh, we need firefighters up there with their eyes and ears and actually say, okay, this is what's happening up here. And this is the strategy that um, we're gonna use. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sergio, in, um, in Santiago, down there in Chile, um, what, 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 do you recognize this as an issue and, and how do you deal with it in, in Chile? If, if we've got a building which is you know, operating a stay put, remain in place, and that's now become compromised because of cladding or perhaps an internal failure of compartmentation, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you do that switch and, 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 and uh, what processes? And have you got any, have you got any um, thing you can share with colleagues here about how you would tackle it? Uh, here, what, what, one thing that we've got, Brent uh, and Russ, is that um, unfortunately the compliance with the construction norms, uh, it's done only at the beginning when, when the building is just built and it's checked, but then in the future uh, it's not maintained. So for us, it's, it's more, more than, than, than just one thing. Um, one strategy. The thing is, we try to uh, we try to see case by case. So we've got buildings that have, have been very well maintained, and we have certain things as as as, as doors that would stop that we are sure that will stop uh, uh, smoke, for example, in the staircases. Um, but then then you've got another ones that because of maintenance of the people or, or, or the quality of the building, the, that doors are removed or are always open and, and, and you lose it. Um, so I, I would say our strategy is to evacuate, of course, the floor of fire, one up, maybe two up. Um, and and mm -hmm. that's, that, that's the first strategy. Uh, then, and this is, this is lucky for us, so I, I will speak in usual times, not COVID times, when we have a lot of volunteers running to the, to, to the fire scene and we need to evacuate, we are lucky to have a lot of hands in there. Um, so uh, it, it's a little different probably from, 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 uh, from paid fire departments we, because at the, at the evacuation moment when we need to evacuate the full building, for example, we have a lot of people to stand there and, and guide this thing. Um, so, but, but, but the main strategy is to, is to mm -hmm. first evacuate the fire floor, one up, two up, 
uh, and then we start moving and seeing if we need to do it or not and depends on the quality and the maintenance. And, and have you considered the use of smoke hoods or do you use smoke hoods? Smoke, sorry? Smoke hoods. Smoke hoods that you would go to the occupants of the building and ask them to put a smoke hood no, on if you ask them. We, we, yeah, we've talked, but I, I haven't seen it implemented in Chile. Okay. Uh, Just conscious of time on this, I wanted to move on to a, uh, another question, and that's to do with um, uh, the use of um, um, high-rise vehicles, turntable ladders, hydraulic platforms, etc. Um, and we had a question through from um, from Ben Gallagher, who's um, an operational policy and assurance manager at London Fire Brigade. Um, has any of the fire departments looked at specific firefighting tactics user, utilizing area, aerial appliances with regards to high-rise buildings? Um, so the use the use of aerial appliances is that is that is that something you guys have got pre-planning for or is it just too distinct which is which is obviously a, a covering jet a, a large jet and possibly rescues is there is there any other kind of pre-planning that you guys might use curtis what's your experience you you you've you've seen a lot of fire departments in the states uh, regarding the apparatus russ yeah i'm just thinking about pre-planning and tactical use of those in terms of getting the guys to think about how they're going to use them in a high-rise fire? Well, most of the operation, I'm sure John Esposito and, and Brent would agree, is going to have to occur on the interior of the building. The majority of your operations, both search and rescue and fire attack, are going to have to come out of the stairwell, not the exterior of the building. You're just not going to win the day from the outside, especially in, in upper floor fires. Once you get out of the reach of the aerial streams, you're, you're kind of handcuffed anyway. Even then, you only have a, a peripheral reach within the floor plate. So your efforts to suppress the fire and uh, perform search and rescue for the fire area and the floors above that are affected by smoke travel are going to have to occur out of the stairwell. And the uh, elevators moving the firefighters up to the staging floor, two floors below the fire. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, uh, I know we can't get you on screen, but hopefully you can answer. Um, one of the one of the, um, the difficult questions that I get asked a lot is the use of AOVs on staircases. Uh, we have it within our codes and standards that we have a an AOV open and shut switch on the ground floor of buildings. Um, in your experience, uh, in your expertise, as, as somebody who knows this subject very well, in a high rise firefighting operation, when, when would you shut an AOV? When would you advise crews to shut AOVs on a staircase? Well, if you have an operating system um, which is maintained and which has some kind of knowledge and programming behind it, we would try not to interfere at all because we would expect that these systems work automatically and we don't have uh, to really work on them because we think it's too complicated for the fire service to really interact and understand uh, in a not automatic mode, but in a hand mode with these uh, systems. Uh, so normally they should work without any interference of the fire service. But yes, if as soon as we start to operate in a building, as soon as we stretch hose lines, we have to realize that we interfere with this design of the building. And um, stretching a hose line means keeping a door open and having open doors maybe interferes with this system, but nevertheless, in the first sense, as a fire service, we would expect these systems to be designed to work also when the fire department is working on scene and is stretching their hose lines. Um, other than that, I think there are so many different systems worldwide. We have negative or positive pressure systems in hallways, in staircases, uh, so I think it's hard to get an, um, 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 a universal answer to such a question. Sure, I know that uh, quite often when I talk to firefighters and uh, I show them the A AOV open and shut switch at the bottom of the staircase and I say to them, do you know what that is? And listen, I'm, I'm just sharing this with you. Most of them don't know what it is and don't know what it's used for. Um, so I think that's worthy of some consideration, certainly if it's being provided. But I want to now move on to the speaker's high-rise firefighting tips. Um, so to start off with, uh, Brent, um, you, uh, I asked you this and you said uh, weapon selection and, and know your flow. Um, do you mind um, talking about that without necessarily having the camera on you? Is that right? Would you mind just describing what you mean? 
Yeah, so when we talk um, uh, weapon selection, uh, we were struggling with a smaller diameter hose line and fog nozzle. And we saw Adam's um, presentation there uh, talking about standpipe debris. Uh, we call it uh, trabriculated pipe. Uh, anytime you have metal, oxygen, and water, uh, you're going to have that standard standpipe debris. What's also happened, though, is you get the uh, fire department connections, and they get full um, with debris, like pop cans and uh, dinky cars. And what happened to me at one fire was actually a bird's nest came through and blocked the nozzle, or um, you guys call it the branch. So we have had significant um, nozzle blockages and it was in relation to the fog nozzle. So we have switched um, to the smooth bore um, nozzle and we haven't had any um, blockages since then. Uh, we also, when, when you are uh, selecting your weapon selection, uh, you need to take some factors and you need to know what are what is the desired flow that you wanna flow. And you also need to know what that building is capable, capable of producing. So as us, uh, we took the NFPA standard and um, we can meet that. In order to do that, we had to switch to the smooth bore with a one and one eighth tip. And we also had to uh, go from inch and a half hose lines. Brent, uh, can you just quote that to NFPA standard for people on this? What's the NFPA standard we're talking about? Uh, there, there's a few. So we looked at NFPA 1710 and we looked at <laughs> NFPA 14. And we also looked at NFPA 13E, and it suggests the two and a half or the 65 millimeter hose with the one and one eighth tip. Um, so that's uh, our standard now um, in our city, and it has made a huge difference. Uh, we're putting 1,003 liters per minute um, at low building pressures. So we, we're, we're still pre-1993 NFPA. We were guaranteed 65 PSI or 450 KPA uh, in the building systems. I know in the States, uh, they went up to 700 uh, KPA or 100 PSI. Um, but in Canada and, and in our city, we're, we're still dealing with low pressure. So we have to use uh, the 65 millimeter hose. So when you are working, we're looking at your weapon selection. It's not just the, the, the hose you're looking at. It's it's pairing that nozzle and hose together to get those flow rates um, that you need. And when you look at Adam's presentation, adding that debris uh, factor um, into it that all standpipe systems have, not just in Canada, obviously uh, in the UK and, and in North America, it, it, is, it is a standard problem that we're dealing with. And that's why we, when we selected our weapons, it is, it is, it is smooth bore. Wow, a lot of firefighters are worried about the nozzle reaction. I sent you a quick video yesterday. Um, we take that 100 pounds of nozzle reaction, we take it to ground, um, and it's, 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 it's very little. Uh, we keep the hose grounded, um, and we're only moving really 50 feet of charged, um, uh, charged, charged hose line. But I would, I would recommend any, any country, any fire department, is find out what you want to flow, find out what your buildings are capable of supplying you, and then come up with that perfect hose and nozzle package. We're also doing um, in Canada, I know it's, it's, it's uh, very popular in North America, is we actually have a gate and gauge. So as soon as we hook up to that riser, uh, we know the type of pressures that we're getting. We know um, what we're going to be flowing on our fires. We do so just, it for sorry, just, Brent, just to be clear on terminology here. So coming out of the wet standpipe or the dry standpipe, dry riser, wet riser, as we would call it, you would plug in a gate and gauge, which is, is a connector, which is going to show you, you can you can throttle the valve, you can control the valve, but also it will give you pressure and flow. Is that right? That's correct. So um, our, our best operating pressure is 450 kPa, which is 65 PSI. Um, so we have a hose and nozzle package designed for those type of pressures. Um, with that gate and gauge um, that we put on the uh, wet riser first, that'll tell us if um, what, what our pressures are for troubleshooting. If uh, we hook up and we're well below that 450 kPa, uh, we know we have to pump into the FDC connection or we know we have to do an improvised standpipe, but we know... Um, to go into plan B and C because of that gate and gauge, because we know 
what that systems or the potential that system is going to give us. And it, and it is by having that gate and gate. When we add a second attack line, uh, again, we're looking at those gate and gauges. Uh, we do this at our residential house fires. When our engines or our pumpers pull up, we're using our, our gate and gauges on the pump. And we had to start doing that with our high rise fires. So really the pump operator in a high rise fire or the engine operator in a high rise fire is up there on the fire floor. And it's the nozzle team that is um, setting our own pressures and, and um, controlling what we're flowing on the fire. Thanks, is, that's, that's, that's fantastic tip. Thanks so much, Brent, that's great. Uh, next up, uh, Michael. Thank you. Okay, I knew that um, the nozzle reaction and water flow topic is uh, talked by others. So I try to focus on smoke control and avoiding to spread smoke in building fires. And we all have to realize that our personal and national firefighting experience is influenced by a lot of topics. And we are all children of our history and the training we were given. Uh, I'm really a fan of the Paris Fire Department because they have really well-trained um, young firefighters that can do outside operations with hook ladders. My fire departments in Germany would never be able to do this. And it's just an example uh, for me that if you have certain equipment and you train with them, you will use them depending if others maybe solve problems with other tools as well. So I think it's interesting on such an international point of view to look what others are doing and try to think if this fits in your own uh, environment. Next slide, please. Uh, so you have to know your rescue and extinguishment strategy. Uh, do you want to do a full evacuation or defend in place? Like in our country, in, in Germany, we don't deal with the population too much. If they feel that they are in danger and they want to leave the building, they can do. We don't tell them to stay in place. They can decide on their own. So we have two staircases in our environment with high rise buildings. Otherwise, we have very safe uh, staircases. Um, and we have to think if we do an aggressive or a defensive uh, extinguishment and the defensive uh, in our language, um, meaning we think that we don't want to interfere with the burning regime um, of a fire in a building. We just want to more confine them. So you have to know all these basics and this training is necessary to go on the fight and you have to train uh, like you fight in the next slide. Um, for example, the smoke hoods would have been discussed quite a few times. Some countries have them, some use them very extensively, and some others seem never have heard of them at all. Uh, on the right picture, you see one German firefighter with a person uh, which he rescues, and normally we have with every firefighter a smoke hood with a filter. But on the left uh, picture below, this is a four-person four a, a trip team in Germany to rescue a fallen firefighter, but all of these four firefighters have a divider with them so they can actually get one civilian under a smoke hood uh, which flows air. So a four person team can go into a building and rescue four civilians through a smoke filled staircase. And we use these hoods quite extensively. If you don't have them, you not have any experience, you don't need them. Uh, if you have them, you really use them. Uh, another example, uh, there are 30,000 uh, smoke curtains used worldwide. There are countries who use them every time they open a door, and there are some countries uh, who never heard of them at all. That's just another topic, but for us in Germany, the stairway security is very important. We would never um, let smoke flow into a staircase when there is no need, because we can't control that maybe five minutes later some civilians want to use this stairway as an egress route. Next slide. So um, on these pictures, it's just a discussion we often have about how we interact as firefighters when we stretch our hose line and we stretch it through doors. If we keep these doors open with a chart by 90 degree, we allow smoke to flow into staircases. But if we don't control these doors in an open place, they can lock our hose line. I think this is a practical experience which is well known all around the world and we have really be careful about our tactic do we allow smoke to travel into a hallway of an of an of a level 
Do we allow smoke to spread into a staircase? How many staircases do we have? And do we really want to extinguish between attack uh, and evacuation staircases? We don't have this tactic in Germany. Yeah, so um, these tactical things often interfere with the building design. And we really think that it is necessary that we know roughly about the safety design of building about how the building pressurized maybe a staircase, how the smoke is removed, especially in high rise buildings. And if we know a lot of this information from the system, then we really can interact as a fire department and do a good job. Uh, that's just a central Europe perspective. I think it's necessary all around the world to look at your environment and your tools and your tactics. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I think it's fair to say that uh... Uh, the UK now is, is adopting smoke curtains uh, across yes. the country and they're in yes. use and they're certainly being trialled. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Curtis, um, I've labelled yours pump operations and you've got some slides. The key thing is most of the time the building pumps will be doing the job, but in the event the building pump or pumps fail, then the fire department will have to supply the standpipe system from the exterior. But uh, typically, the way it's set up, you have a check valve between the fire pump room and the exterior FDC connection on the outside of the building. So you're not really augmenting the system because whoever provides the greatest pressure wins the day. So you'll either provide the greater pressure and take over from the fire pump, and it'll cycle off and shut down. Curtis, can I just ask? Curtis, can I just ask what FDC stands for? Fire department connection. Okay, thank you or the, uh, the fire pump will be doing the job and you won't be moving any water into the system, but it's important to understand the rise pressure in these, in these buildings. One, this, a lot of the standpipe systems aren't, aren't designed to handle high pressures. So sometimes the maximum can be a, as low as 300 to 350 PSI. And in tall buildings, you're gonna have to demand much higher pressure because you're moving water essentially half a pound a foot and I'm sorry, I'm not doing the, the, uh, the uh, European standards, but when you're talking rise pressure, we're taught from rookie school to pump five pounds per story, but it's actually six for office buildings. So it's five pounds for most of your residential and hotel buildings and six pounds per story for office buildings. The reason is that the slab to slab ratios are greater in your office environment. So your hotel and residentials typically average 10 foot floors, and in an office environment, you'll see 12 to 14 foot floors. But something that's worth noting is that now there's an influx of new construction where the younger crowd are demanding higher ceilings and you're seeing office slab to slab ratios now increase to 15 feet per floor. So that raises your pressure from five pounds from hotel to office uh, to six for office now up to seven to seven and a half and so your rule of thumb has to change depending on the occupancy which makes it a little bit difficult when you're dealing with mixed use occupancies where you could have office at the base of the building and then hotel at the midpoint of the building and then residential at the top the high dollar floors and each one of those can have different systems different floor to slab to slab ratios for an instant we just finished a building in new york that's a 104 story building in hudson yards but its true floors are 87 so that's something else to take in consideration is marketing floors versus actual floors because a lot of times they'll they'll skip floors for marketing purposes. You can get more more rent or more money from selling condominiums or apartments on tall buildings if you live in the 85th floor, even though technically it could be the 68th floor. And that's an instance that you have to be sure as to how many floors the building has in actual slab to slab to the roof ratios because they can skip floors and that throws your pump pressures off. The key thing with uh, pressure regulating valves and your standpipes is, is knowing the building has PRVs. And there are two types of PRVs, set pressure and percentage space. Most of the ones you'll see out there are percentage space. So they're, they operate based on the, the system pressure in the riser. So if you have a system pressure of 400 PSI, 
in the fires on the third floor of let's just say a, a 38 story building, then you don't pump to the fire floor anymore. You pump to the roof. If it's a single zone riser, you pump to the 38th floor, even though the fire's on the third floor. Because if you don't, the valve, the pressure regulating valve that's based on a percentage of that head pressure net or the system pressure and riser will not function as it's designed. So in actuality, you pump to the top of the zone regardless of what floor the fire is on or the PRV, the pressure regulating valve will not work as it's designed and your flow pressure could be as low as 50 PSI which is dangerous because typically uh, 50 gallons a minute for 50 gallons a minute in a high rise environment, we're really looking at closer to 250 to 300 gallons a minute for adequate fire flow in an open floor configuration. Or if you're confronted with a wind driven fire, you just can't have low flows because you, the firefighters will be uh, driven off the floor. And FDC labeling are also important as well as protecting your hose lines. As you'll see in this, this slide here, it's important to protect the umbilical cord to the building should the fire pump fail early on because if the fire progresses on the fire floor or a floor above and it takes over one to two floors, you can have a release of the curtain wall. So you have the curtain wall, which is the uh, aluminum mullions and the, uh, the glass cascading down the side of the building and severing your, your feed lines to the FDCs as fast as you can lay them. So early on, you want to just do a light charge, approximately 50 PSI to the FDC. Again, the fire pump probably will be doing the job. You won't. And put over tarps and ladders uh, over your hose to protect. So in case the glass is cascading down the side of the building, you don't sever those critical feeds to the standpipe connections. And that's important as well as pumping off the opposite side of the building and making sure you're, you're not close to those high pressure hose. And the hose to the FDCs need to be high pressure, a special hose, and then the ability of the fire pumpers to produce high pressure. So if, you're, if you have, let's just say a 50 story building, you have to generate 450 PSI to get water to the upper floors. That's two pumpers pumping in series or pressure to generate that kind of pressure. So if it's new pumpers, they may have an automatic dump valve that expels the water and dumps it on the intake side of the pump at approximately 150 PSI. So with new pumpers, you may not be able to generate high pressure and pump it into the second pumper that increases the pressure to the FDC. So know your equipment, make sure your, your hose is adequate for high pressures and make sure the system can handle those pressures because it's very important you don't blow or overpressurize or blow those victolic couplings. Those victolic couplings are the collars that go around the pipes vertically and they can blow at excessive pressures. And if you blow the standpipe riser, you're one, gonna lose critical firefighting water and two, you're gonna dump the water in the stairwell which is gonna end up in the bottom of the building and that's typically where, typically where you'll find your key infrastructure, your transformer and switch gear rooms, your generator rooms, your fire pump rooms, bulk locations, the hazardous material. So that's areas you, one, don't want to get wet and don't want to lose. So it's important you not overpressurize the system, but also make sure you're pressurizing it with the right system pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. That was a uh... That was a, a tour de force. You really shot through that. And I appreciate your uh, being concise on that. I know you've got, this is a huge passion of yours. The only man I know whose number plate on his car is high rise. Um, <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, Sergio, um, patient movement at a recent incident. I think you wanted to share with us a case study of a recent fire you went to. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Just, just uh, this is a sub Subcategory, if you want to see it in a certain way of, of evacuation, people think we just talk. And it's 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 a fire that we had on, on January of this year on a hospital of, um, of, of the public sector. Um, very huge. And, and the first slide is just for you to to see the size and and and, and the smoke that was uh, was that was produced at this point. So uh, a subcategory of evacuation people is evacuation of patients in, in, in our way to see it. Um, just First slide is to show you, as I said, uh, the size of the incident. We evacuated over 350, um, 350 patients. Uh, I would say like 20 or 25 were COVID positive. 
So we had an issue there. Uh, if, if you can move to the next slide, Russ, please. Um, so so th this is our learning point, some pictures on the evacuation. Um, one, one thing we discovered is, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mention a couple of things. One, one thing we discovered is that actually in a hospital fire, uh, three things happened and, and, and we call it that three different fires were going on. So one was actually the fire control, the people with hoses and water. Uh, the next one was the uh, patient evacuation. And the third one was the hazmat that was going on with all these things that were that were proper of a hospital. So in, in the evacuation, we our learning point here and what I, uh, what I wanted to share is that, um, of course, is is and it's it's may, may maybe sounds obvious, but just wanted wanted, wanted to bring it again to, to the table is um, you need to pair up with the people of the hospital. Actually, the fire department you may have many many people, but we don't know what's the most important patient, what patients are movable, and which pa patients are not movable. So, um, just to share what 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 our fire chief did that that day is that they line up. And, and you see it in the below uh, left side of, of the picture, they line, line up uh, teams of, of, fire, of fire, uh, fire, uh, the firefighters and fire volunteers. And they, they, they line up also uh, at just in the right of that picture, uh, the ev ev evacuation medical team of, of the hospital. Uh, and, and making pairs, you make, you also, you use your uh, manpower and you use the hospital knowledge together to evacuate the people that was uh, probably evacuation, uh, that you could evacuate. Um, we were lucky enough to, 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 to make it right, to move 350 people uh, that day. Of course, pre-planning, it's ideal. Uh, if not, just, just wanted to make the point that um, take it slow, uh, a couple of extra minutes. Uh, it's better than rushing out and, and, and giving instructions of, hey, just evacuate because no one takes care of that. Uh, this is a couple of slides. It's, this is the common post. I don't know if you've got to get this Spanish, but in, on the left side of, of the picture, uh, it's 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 a control on the two buildings that had the had the hospital, five stories, eight stories, uh, and 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 what we expected to evacuate. So you see first first floor, second floor of the two buildings, and and they're being evacuated, uh, in, and we were counting the patients uh, that we were were being moved at that time. Um, so, so our le learning point and what, what, what I wanted to share with you today is um, make it in a rush. We understand that patient moving is super in a hurry, but making it in a rush, the only thing that, that brings to you is um, making, making, making confusion and probably not getting where you want to be. So just one speed slower, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's better and, and have, the con have the control in the command post because it's an important task to, to take care in this in these cases. Thanks, Sergio. It looks like it was a, a very large, complicated fire. I think one of the points that comes out of this is going back to the earlier conversation. If we do switch from stay put, remain place to simultaneous, we've had a number of occasions now where we've had 80, 90, 100 families being tipped out onto the street, maybe in adverse weather. Um, and because we used to stay put, all of a sudden the local authorities now have got a real challenge because they may not be going back in the building again uh, and that's been a real issue uh, but thanks for that Sergio that's great uh, John um, policy procedures and training I know you said it wasn't a sexy subject but you just wanted to share it with uh, with with colleagues over to you yeah thanks Russ uh, I think colleagues have already kind of stated lots of the tactical elements when it comes to dealing with these kinds of incidents uh, I think I reflected on this based on the, the comments I made earlier. Uh, I hope just just my sounds improves. Can you just indicate us whether yeah, my no, you're coming through loud and clear. Okay, yeah. So I think the certainly the learning from Grenfell. Um, I wouldn't say that fire and rescue services in the UK have become complacent, but I think we've almost had a bit of an attitude that actually our buildings are safe. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, even historic 1960s concrete high-rise buildings, which have now been repurposed and upgraded have made us look at this more so now. Uh, so obviously on the back of the uh, the Grenfell recommendations then in terms of revision of policy, in terms of national operational guidance from National Fire Chiefs Council, 
uh, through to individual fire and rescue services based on the risk that they face. Uh, clearly within the UK, we've got a fair bit of rural, but, but lots of urban areas as well. So if you take London Fire Brigade, we've got 6,000 high rise residential properties above 18 meters. Uh, here in West Yorkshire, we've got over 500. Uh, but then you've got some services in the UK that which you've got none. Uh, so based on the risk, what they pose depends on how they implement policy, uh, what procedures they put in place. Uh, but I think the fundamental part of all of this for me is those things coming together, uh, certainly with training, exercising, uh, you know, whether that be actual training, which has been more difficult in the built environment during the situation with COVID. Uh, but that's certainly something that we need to pick up more so now to put those policies and procedures into the test environment and ensure that we can do that. Uh, there's been lots of chat uh, in the sidebar regarding PEEPs. Uh, clearly, that's going to be a, a major issue for us in terms of understanding how we do that based on within the UK, uh, the so responsible just, persons. Uh, just, just for the benefit of international colleagues, PEEPs, uh, Personal Emergency Evacuation Plan, can you just briefly explain what that is? Yeah, so it's uh, basically uh, vulnerable people who may live in, in high-rise buildings, in this case, who will need assistance in terms of leaving that building. Uh, so within in the UK setting, then the responsible person from a, a legislation point of view is, is the person who comes up with those plans, but clearly as the respondent agency, uh, the fire service have got a duty, I suppose, to ensure that we fulfil that as, as part of that uh, kinds of fulfilment to ensure that those people are safe, which is a huge challenge in itself. Uh, certainly within the UK, we, we've got a sliding scale of, you know, really push modern apartments, which present different problems and construction methods. But at the same time, we've got lots of social housing, which is high rise premises. Uh, and lots of people in those social housing environments may be suffering from a number of vulnerabilities from age through to mobility. Uh, and how we deal with that is important too. Uh, so for me, the uh, out of those three words, if you like, uh, I think that the training part of it is the very important part of it, uh, coupled with uh, something within the UK, what we call SSRI, site-specific risk information, uh, so ensure that crews are familiar with the buildings within their area uh, and they regularly visit them, make sure that they are aware of the systems uh, within them buildings. I know Russ alluded to the uh, the venting systems and buildings and potentially what the knowledge of firefighters are around those. Uh, so really, it's a it's a complete rethink, I think, in some ways in the UK in terms of understanding how we ob achieve our objectives when we're faced with these kinds of incidents. Uh, particularly when it comes to saving life and evacuating buildings, uh, I think is part of your uh, initial question and before us in terms of evacuation strategies potentially changing during an incident. Uh, certainly those that have been following the Grenfell inquiry, you know, there's often terminology and language used around a, a window of opportunity when evacuation strategies could have been changed in terms of allowing and informing those people to evacuate the building uh, during that incident. Uh, so really mine was a bit of a genetic statement in terms of all of those things coming together uh, because I don't think there's a single approach. I think based on risk, based on policy procedures, training equipment, all of those things have to come together. And I think interestingly, just uh, certainly Michael's input over smoke control and your statement was around most of the fire and rescue services in the UK are adopting smoke curtains uh, to control the protected core in terms of the stairwell. Uh, likewise, the vast majority of the UK fire and rescue services are also opting to buy um, smoke escape hoods, uh, and they have been used extensively within the UK over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, I know there was uh, the New Providence uh, kind of place building uh, I think they used 22 uh, smoke escape hoods as part of that incident a few weeks ago. So it's becoming more and more common practice in terms of the, the rethink within the UK in terms of how we deal with these kinds of incidents. But yeah, not not a sexy, sexy kind of three words in that case. <laughs> but I, 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 I think you know certainly uh, all of what other colleagues have spoken about, it's a combination of those things coming together for a successful outcome. Thanks, John, and um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for a, um, 
a sense of um, discreet humility, I think now amongst the UK fire service people uh, talking about, I think we have, we have got things to learn and things to share with colleagues who, who, and that's part of the initiative of this group. So thanks, thanks for contributing, John. I really appreciate it. Uh, John, in uh, New York, um, your subject was smoke problems with lower floor fires. Do you want to just, um, just fill us in on, on your tips for that? Uh, yes, and it's uh, along the lines of what Michael spoke about earlier, that, that you know, the, the smoke spread throughout the building is very problematic. So the, the lower the floor, or I should say the greater the number of floors above the fire is going to be the greater, it's a greater problem to deal with. So the fire service comes in and puts out the fire, one room fire, small fire on a lower floor. We can't forget about that smoke that's going up through the building. So the building is built to try to limit the spread of the smoke. And again, as Michael said, we open the door to stretch a hose line through there. And that now allows the smoke to get into the stairway. Uh, we send people specifically up to the upper floors to make sure the doors are closed. The stairway doors are closed. We'll identify an attack stair and we'll identify an evacuation stair. And we'll try to get that information to the people in the building which is very difficult because most of our residential buildings, high rise residential buildings, do not have a central communication system where we're able to send the same message throughout the entire building. So just uh, it's an important fact to be kept in mind about the smoke spread throughout the building. Uh, doors open, we are, uh, we are piloting the, the smoke curtains uh, to put over the, the doorways of the attack stair to try to limit that smoke in there. Uh, but it remains the fact that we have an awful lot of smoke that we have to deal with. Uh, we strongly recommend uh, that people shelter in place in their apartments. Um, and when they, when they do come out, we'll bring them into another apartment if we can't get them back into theirs. We try not to move them through the, through the smoke uh, out of the building. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um... Last but not least, uh, Mark, uh, fire safety done right. Thanks, Russ, and thanks to all the previous speakers. And it's a it's been a really interesting array of topics so far. <clears throat> Mine is a bit like John's. I'm a bit of a preacher on the fire safety front, in that you know to be a to be an effective fire officer, you have to have input into the effective design and and the construction of of new modern buildings and into the renovation and restoration of older buildings to ensure safety for not only our firefighters, but not only the occupants, sorry, but also our firefighters when we operate in those structures. So <clears throat> I mentioned before, we've had a number of small cladding fires in Australia, which we've dealt with by having aggressive external uh, uh, fire attacks using 70 millimeter hand ground lines with you know, smooth ball branches up to about 25 to 30 metres, uh, in one case, <clears throat> over 45 metres from one overzealous motor officer who was able to get the, the, uh, the pump at maximum capacity and, and pump the water. So one of the issues we have with that is that you don't want to actually rupture the envelope of the structure. So you don't want to break windows or force in any, any venting or uh, ventilation shafts that could allow the ingress of, of at worst, at, at best smoke, at worst flame. So, you know, it's not only a matter of having hard, you know, tactical skills in firefighting, you also have to have knowledge in how buildings work and how we put fire safety into those buildings. We recently had a high rise fire in the center of Sydney and it was on level 32, I believe. It was a fire contained to the room of origin because it was a bounding construction and it was a fire, uh, fire compartment. It was contained to the source of the fire, which was a stove. Somebody had put a hairdryer on top of a, an electric stove and, and accidentally turned the electric stove on. It was contained and extinguished by the sprinkler. It was able to be accessed by firefighters through twin stairs. One was being used for simultaneous evacuation of the occupants of the fire floor. The other one, firefighters used the fire stairs to get to the fire floor. They were able to use an internal hydrant system to charge a line of 38 millimetre hose and go and put out the surrounding areas of the fire in the fire department. Now, it sounds like, you know, it's, it's, 
it, it sounds all good to be true, but what it proves to me is in this environment that, you know, we need to get our fire safety engineering correct the first, the first time so that, you know, the job is easier for our firefighters and it's safer for the building occupants. So again, I know it's it's not as sexy as, uh, I really liked Adam's presentation. I learned a lot. We were just starting to install dry risers in Australia. There was a little, there's a lot of hesitation towards going to dry high risers from the wet risers we currently use in our high rise. But the trade-off for us was we now have sprinklers in every building above three levels. So it's it's squid pro quo. You've got to give something to get something. So we'll see moving forward how we live with the dry risers. And I look forward to a presentation from somebody around the world in one of these future opportunities, Russ, that's going to be able to tell tell me and educate me about dry risers because we currently don't have them in Australia, which is what I'm thinking is probably not a bad thing, but unfortunately it's a certainty for us moving forward. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Russ. Yeah, I think what you have got in Australia, and I know, uh, Mark, which is great, is um, the ability to cross-connect wet risers with sprinkler systems and also augment from an external pump, which is not something that happens around the world. But we, perhaps we can pick that up as a subject. OK, so thanks to all of our contributors today, in particular Adam Course for his normal great feature, looking back to look forward, and all of our panellists that you just heard from. So Brent Brooks, um, Curtis Massey, uh, Michael Reek, John Roberts, um, John Esposito, uh, Sergio Selman, and uh, Mark Riley. Thanks to all of those for contributing. Um, and just a note, if you've got an idea for a feature on this program, or you'd like to pose a question to our international panels in the future, please do drop me an email so you can get in contact with me. Uh, the next program that we're hoping to produce is to coincide with the 150th anniversary of the Great Fire of Chicago. So we're, we're hoping to have some, uh, some, some information about that and something for you to think about and reflect upon. Um, and also, we've got some interesting features in the next one, in particular, the, uh, the latest developments on virtual reality training for high-rise firefighting. So look out for that when, uh, when we advertise it and, and spread the word. Um, a couple of dates for your diary. Um, the next um, big thing for us is our conference next year in London, the 17th to the 19th of May in London, uh, where we will be hopefully attracting firefighters from all around the world to talk about high-rise firefighting and some of the issues. And in particular, we're, we're very interested to get opinions on the subject of firefighters going above the fire in high-rise firefighting. Uh, and, and whether or not they're wearing breathing apparatus. So if you've got a view on that or an opinion, uh, then please get in touch. If there is a, a high rise fire in your country and you can get some details, please send them to me so that we can circulate them to our colleagues around the world. Uh, and we'll always endeavor to share that information on our website, www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com. So it only remains for me to say um, thanks again to everybody that helped to produce this program. And uh, remember, our strap line is go high and go well. And until the next program, stay safe. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you and sharing information again soon. Thanks very much. Bye.